Hi everyone, Dennis here. Welcome back to another video in my channel. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at Replit Agent. And I've been hearing about this tool a lot and I want to see firsthand what the buzz is about. We will be building a web application using Replit Agent from scratch. Uh, you'll see every step of the process, including fixing bugs and errors. And you will witness firsthand how well it works. I will make this as realistic as possible. And we'll see if we can take a real world project and turn it into an actual a working web application. We will be building a real estate app where a user can log in and manage this listing, including uh, property address, add photos, and so on. So that will be the goal for this video. And I will show you guys how to navigate the tool by building the app and navigate through the various features. So we will deploy the application to a Replit server. So I'll show you guys how that works as well. And lastly, I will give you my thoughts on Replit agent as a developer who has been building stuff for 16 years. If you're new to my channel, my name is Dennis and I'm a principal software engineer and I make videos on coding, AI and automation. This video should be a fun one. Let's go and start by going over what Replit is. So Replit is essentially a coding platform where you can write, run and share code in different program languages right in your browser. They support any programming languages that you can think of, uh, C Sharp, Java, uh, Python, C++, JavaScript, and so on. Replit Agent is a feature of Replit that they just released about a month ago uh, that uses AI to assist users while coding on the Replit platform. It provides suggestions, uh, helps with debugging, and can even write code snippets based on user prompts. The goal of Replit Agent is to make coding easier and more efficient by offering uh, real-time support, enhancing the coding experience. The cool thing about uh, Replit Agent is it gives you the full software engineering experience from prototyping up to deployment and it even includes source control which I'll show you guys in a little bit how it works. So if you have used uh, Cursor IDE before, it has a, a very similar experience where it will modify the project files for you. In terms of their pricing model, while Replit Agent is on a limited access, you will have to sign up for their core plan in order to use the Replit Agent. This is currently priced at $15 per month if you pay annually or uh, $25 per month if you want to go for uh, per month access. I highly recommend to try it out for one or two months before going for annual just to test it out by building a couple of apps if it's the right thing for you. Let's go and log in into Replit. I already purchased a core plan, which is required if you want to build uh, with Replit Agent. Let's go and start by building this application. All right, so I'm logged in into Replit now. This is the ex same experience that you're probably accustomed to if you have used Replit before. Essentially, you can create a new repo, that's what they call it, and you can create a template. You can use any of these templates or you can import from GitHub, from your from existing a repository. So you can create it from here. This is like the usual experience that you're probably used to. And then at the bottom right, you can see all the repos that you've done previously. You can go through them and go back and edit them. The new thing that they just added is in this create with Replit agent, uh, which we're going to be touching on in a little bit. But let's go and uh, take a look at a few things that you can do inside of Replit. This is what they're known for. Uh, you can go to any of these templates. I write a lot of C sharp. So I, I usually I would tend to like write some stuff here, create repo, and then just hit create repo, and it will generate a random name for that project. It's have that same experience. Uh, you can have the files on the left hand side. And then at the bottom right, you're going to have the tools that's available that you can use in your project. And then on the right hand side, you have like a split window where you have the console and then you have this experience. This is totally brand new. You can interact with the AI, uh, similar to Copilot, if you use Copilot before. So you have your console over here. If you run this, it's going to go and execute and run this code for you. Whatever uh, language that you're working with, the output is going to be on the right hand side and then the shell allows you to type in and write uh, commands uh, to be be executed. That's a basic Replit experience. You can add a new file here. For instance, I want to create like a test.cs, whatever, and then I can just create and start write, writing right here. I can create using AI as well and start from there, public class test. And then it has this experience where it gives you this IntelliSense. It knows what you're trying to write. It tries to predict out of time what you're, what you're trying to do. You see here, it gives me a little bit of hint, like public static. I can just go and hit tab and then void. So it was just hinted for me. I can go and hit tab again. And then I'll try to think a little bit. You can add it right here and then it gives you that experience, which is cool. And you can run it uh, the same way and tab it. If I run this, it should execute, which I believe it should. Um, 
using system, which is probably where the error comes from. So that's the basics of using Replit. Let's go and check out the Replit agent, which is what uh, we're here for. Well, let's go and create a REPL here. So instead of choosing a template, we're gonna go and create with a REPL agent. I wanna do a, a real estate agent property listing management. Let's go and type in a simple prompt here. Let's create an app for a real estate agent where he can manage his property. All right, so it's going to be a simple prompt. I know for a fact that it's only going to be using a specific technology for this since you can't really specify if you want to use Next.js or React or Angular or whatever backend that you're using. I know that they're using Flask for building this application and they're using Postgres as well for SQL. Let's go and just ride with this for now and hopefully they can add more uh, technologies in the future. Let's start building this application. And you can also talk and dictate uh, your prompt if you want to, or you can add an attachment. For instance, if you want to attach a screenshot from a website that you want to take inspiration from, uh, you can go and do that as well. But we're not going to be doing that in this one. We're just going to let it build on its own and see what it comes up with. You can see here that the Replit agent is in early access. The agent is an experiment product. It will do its best to fulfill your request but expect occasional errors or unexpected behavior. Let's go and continue. All right, so it created a new project. You can see here, it created this real estate manager project underneath my username here. Right now, it's determining the best approach. It gives you this preview in the middle, what it's trying to build. Right now, it created a plan on what we're gonna be building today. It says right here that we're gonna be building a property management app for real estate agents using Flask and Vanilla.js. The app will allow agents to manage property listings, including adding, editing, and deleting properties. It will also feature a search function and a responsive design. Let me know if you'd like to proceed with this plan. Let's gonna go and check the build the initial prototype. And I also included some additional features that can also include as part of this. Implement a client management system for tracking potential buyers, add a calendar features for scheduling property viewings integrate with mapping services. So it gives me some additional features that I might have not thought about. So in this case, I'm just gonna go and keep, I like the idea of adding a calendar here, which actually, which actually I've never thought about adding. I just thought about just adding a property listing where I can manage the different listings that I have as a real estate agent, for instance. And the mapping itself would be cool as well if we want to incorporate Google Maps feature where you can, it gives you this interface where it, it gives you a pin of where that location is in the map. But we're going to go and just stick with the initial prototype as I don't want it to complicate it. The, uh, the first part of this, I just want to make sure that you can build the initial prototype first that I initially asked for. Then we can add additional features on top of it. And so that's the approach that I usually want to take uh, when using something like this. Let's go and approve and start. Right off the bat, it's going to go back to the interface that I showed you earlier. It's going to give you the tools on the bottom, which you can collapse and also give you the files on that top left where it gives you this uh, experience where you can go through each file and, and edit it if you want to. Currently, it's going to give you this progress tab right here. You can have multiple tabs that's running on the very top. And right now it's currently on the progress tab where it will give you um, a little bit of preview of what it's doing. On the right hand side, it's going to give you the AI chat where you can chat and you can click on any of these files and open up that file and it would direct you to where that file has, has changed. You can see here that it has created so far a bunch of files, HTML and JavaScript, and then currently it's installing a Python dependency such as Flask, Flask, SQL, Alchemy, and some other um, validators that's going to be used for this project. Right now it's adding just a bunch of files and um, dependencies. It's currently installing those ones. All right, so here it is. I think it's finished. Currently, if you see here in the top, you can see here that it's running and it will open up the web view. This is the same view that you usually will see when you're trying to debug or you're trying to preview the, the actual projects. Currently, this is the homepage that it generated. Let's take a look at the right hand side. You can see here that show this bunch of files that it created here and you can click on each one. It will take you to that part of the progression when it started to create that 
file that creates the models, essentially tends to store this data inside of a database. And then we can go and view all the properties here. Currently the view the properties are not working. Let's go and tell it to fix that. So when dealing with types of errors, I noticed like there's a bunch of stuff that can be changed. I want to be specific and I want to make sure that I'm tackling all these different errors and issues one at a time as opposed to going at it like simultaneously. Even if I found that there's some UI errors that's very visible, I'm just going to go and wait on that and make sure that the errors are fixed first before proceeding into the next step. Let's go and see how it does. We can see here what type of things it fixed. Edited the routes. You can see here the, the change that happened. I created a form here. Uh, you can see here that it, when you go to the properties now, it's fixed. By fixing the route, which it did, you can see here that the diff between the previous version and the current version right now is now setting the actual correct properties here. It looks like it's just missing this form right here that's being passed in as part of the view which was expected and it created this search form let's go back to the web view if you don't see for for some reason you accidentally close the web view you can just go and create a new tab and just search for web view you have access to all the different things that you have inside of this you can also manually stop and run this if for some reason you want to restart the server you can go and hit stop and that will automatically just stop it for you you can restart it that way all right, so let's go and take a look at viewing all the properties. That's pretty cool. It kind of give us like a nice UI here for being able to see all the different listings for our properties. You can view the details for each one. It looks like everything is being stored correctly in the database, which is what I originally intended. It was like a pretty short prompt, but it looks like it did everything. Let's go and take a look at what was stored in actually in the database. The way to do that is you can go and query Postgres, Postgres SQL database by going and looking for the tools. Under the tools, you can look for Postgres uh, SQL and you can access the same thing if you go here at the bottom uh, where the tools are, the, the tools panel, by going and going straight to Postgres SQL. Uh, and from here, you can access the, the different things that's available for us, right? The environment variables specific to the Postgres database. And you can see the different schema for the database. You can see the different tables. Currently it has, looks like a couple of tables here, one for the property and one for the user. It looks like it, it will allow us to actually create or log in as a user and manage these properties. All right, so these are the information about the database. You can see the database size, how big the tables are. You can just view all the different properties. Using the properties, it will give you some documentation here on how to use it. And I'm just going to go and, and proceed with this and see what else can we change. So I'm going to go and close that one. It looks like the property has changed. And yeah, look, it's still running something. It did something and it's reviewing the instructions and still doing some stuff. Let's go and wait until it finishes, but it looks like it's still uh, building some stuff. It looks like it's, there's a bunch of changes here as well. It took a screenshot if you, if you look at this one right here every time it creates like a bunch of changes it, it creates milestones you can preview what the application looks like at some point in time right it's going to give you the history of what it's doing behind the scenes so you can understand the process and what's being done and what's being changed i think we're good and then it just finished the initial prototype now it completed just now and then it looks like it gives us this milestone. Now it says ready to share, deploy this REPL to production. We'll give you this hints uh, along the way if you're satisfied with the application. One thing that I want to do firsthand is I want to connect my GitHub into this so I can take a, snip, a snapshot myself and I want to be able to push this inside of source control. The way you can do that is you want to add a new tab and you want to add uh, source control here. I'm going to go and look for Git which is the source control that I have here. But you need to set up your source control. You need to go and go to your settings and you need to connect your GitHub account to be able to use this feature. In my case, I, I didn't provide any remote URL for the GitHub information here for the repository name. You can type whatever repository name that you want and then it's gonna have the repository description. Let's go and give this a description, a real estate listing management app. And that will be built using applet agent 
Okay, so now we can signify whether if you want to be a public or a private, I'm going to keep it as private. Since I already have connected my GitHub profile here, I can go and just create this repository in GitHub. I can go and click on this and this will push all the files that I have to GitHub. Uh, I'm just going to go and create a repository in GitHub. And then it says right here, pass GitHub credentials. Let's go ahead and confirm for this session only. And then you have to push this branch as origin to master. Let's go ahead and push that. All the files that's been changed so far has now been pushed. All right, so here it is. You can see the different changes and commits. Um, the, the timeline is based on when the file has been committed. Since we're using Replit agent, every time we make a change to the actual code base, it's actually going to create a milestone. The commits are committed internally inside of Replit agent. All the change has been done 11 minutes ago. It's going to be in sync as far as when that change has been committed. And then anything that's been changed afterwards chronologically is going to be on this. Some of this newer changes has been done three minutes ago, for instance. Let's go ahead and continue. I took a little bit of a uh, break 11 hours later. So where are we at? At this point, we've pushed everything to GitHub and everything that's been change inside of Replit has been pushed and synchronized to GitHub at this point. Let's go and take a look at what we have. Let's run this. If you leave the Replit running for a long period of time without doing any activity, it's going to go ahead and perform a stop for you automatically. You just have to hit start once again. If you want to resume and start working on it again, I went and started it and let's go ahead and check out the web view. At this point, this is what we have. I don't believe the search is currently working. We're going to go ahead and take care of that later. But let's go and take a look at see if the register is working. I'm going to go and register for my name and then my email. And then I'm just going to go ahead and put password here. And there it is. I added a new user. Let's go ahead and take a look at Postgres and take a look at. So now it looks like my name has been created as well. One thing I want to take a look at real quick here is how you do a query inside of Postgres. If you want to do a query, you have to go and click on the C database contents. And this is where you can do a select. If you want to do uh, a select uh, from users, I believe you can do this so user and you can go and run the query. Actually, if you want to do, do that, we have to do a you have to add a quotation mark around the user to be able to query that user because user is a reserved keyword in Postgres. So that's not how you do a query inside of Postgres if you want to do additional query or, or if you want to do some joins later on. But let's go and close this. And everything has been pushed out to uh, GitHub, like I said. And let's take a look at what we have at this point. Let's go and log in using my email and go and put my password in. And here we're at. So let's examine what we need at this point. The view details is currently working. You can see the property. Uh, we have a placeholder for our image uh, currently. Uh, but let's add a, a ad listing feature to this website. Let's do a prompt here and say, add a listing, add a feature to create a listing okay, at this point i think since we have two tables already i don't think it's going to create a new table since we already have a property table but let's go and see what the progress is and see what it's going to do next it looks like it's still determining the best approach let's wait and see what happens all right so it edited the templates property form.html and edited the static property js and it edited the property form.html those are the three so you can expect, inspect it as you wish. And it added a new property section here. Let's go and take a look at the web view. And let's see here. Let's go view. Actually, let's go ahead and refresh this. Looks like can't really see it. Let's go to the properties. It might be there. Nope. Let's see where it's at. I don't even see where it's at. Dashboard. Okay. So you have to go to the dashboard in order to add the property. So let's go along with this right now. Before we do this, I noticed that the image URL is not really an uploader. Let's go and change this. I want to change the new property page to accept an image URL 
to a file input where the image is uploaded to Cloudinary. Just gonna do that. And it looks like the image or image URL for the column inside of the property is just pointing to a placeholder URL. So it's actually set up to point to an image URL, which is good. Let's go ahead and see what it does next. It's still determining potential issues. It says I'll update the new property page to accept an image file upload instead of an, an image URL. We'll use Cloudinary for image storage. And this change will involve modifying the form template and the backend logic. I'll let you know once the implementation is complete. All right, so let's go and wait. It added the forms, it added the edited the property form, and then it's waiting to input the Cloudinary API key, secret, and the name. The way to get your API key for Cloudinary is you have to go to your Cloudinary account and you have to go uh, down to, to your Cloudinary settings and then you have to go to your API keys. And then you're gonna see here that you have a Cloudinary name on the top and that's what you're gonna be using here as the name. And then for the API key and the secret, you can now go down here and just copy this one. And for the secret, you can have to make this visible or copy it after you generate a new API key. That's how you can get the API key and the secret and the name for the cloud generic cloud name. Once you got those three values, you're going to and hit add secrets here. And this is going to go ahead and add those secrets inside of the environment variables which you can then later on set it to a different one if you happen to change your API key or create a new one for some reason. Let's take a look at here. It looks like it's still being restarted. And the checkpoint has been made. But at this point, you can see here that you can roll back to here or since it's creating multiple milestones, you can go back to a previous version. You can see up here where the check checkpoint was made six minutes ago. It has its own tracking mechanism that allows you to go back and forth between the different versions. I, I like to be rather safe and just push the change to GitHub myself if everything is good to go, if I'm happy at some point in time. Let's go ahead and take a look at the progress here. Looks like I have to log in here again. Okay, looks like a change to add the new property on the navigation bar on the top. Instead of having to go to the dashboard and add new property, you can just go to add your new property here. And it's cool because you added the property image, which you can see here. Let's go and pick an image. Let's go and some add address here. And then some numbers, three bedroom, two bath, 2,200 square feet, and some description. Let's go and submit this. All right, it looks like the submit button is not working. I noticed that the dev tools here I saw like a couple of errors. I just clicked on this dev tools here. Next to the new tab, you can go and click the dev tools here. So you can show the same console window that you get when you're working locally on your browser in your local PC. So you can see here that you can do a console and you can see here that this submit is not a function. So we're gonna go and copy that, that error that we did receive here. Actually see if we can copy this. Huh. This dot submit is not a function. I was being lazy. I just paste the error that I saw in the console window and so you can figure out the issue from there. I should have been more explicit and added more information related to what the error is about when I submitted on the new property page. But let's go and take a look at if we can figure out what the issue is. All right, so let's go and add a new property again. Put some um, garbage data here and the 2200 test. Let's go ahead and pick from one of the images and let's go ahead and submit. Uh, property form. Okay, let's go ahead and add uh, after uh, submitting the new property, uh, the error in the console says free uh, form dot submit a function. I think it knows what it is. I just gave it a little bit more context and and uh, to know uh, what we're currently working with. 
but it says that I understand the issue. There's a problem with the JavaScript code handling for form submission for a new property listing. I'll fix this by updating the property.js file to cor correctly submit the form. Once the changes are, are made, you should be able to create new property li listings without any errors. All right, so crossing our fingers. It went and reloaded the page. It says percent of results to the user and checkpoint has been made. All right, let's go and add a new property again. I'm pretty optimistic on this one. Let's go and hit test. Three, two, and then some. See if this works. Okay, property submit is not a, it's not a function. Property that submit is not a function. That is the error. The dev. So it looks like it made a change to the property.js and it and removed the property form that submit and it added this e.target that submit function instead. Let's go and see if that actually works. Let's add a new property here again, some numbers and some bedrooms and then square feet and, and add the image and hit submit. E.target.submit is not a function. You're going to be encountering a lot of these. This is going to be a common pattern that you're going to be dealing with when coding inside of Replit Agent. You're going to have to get used to this, especially if you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes. So I'm guessing here that the property form is not really... Property form is not actually valid at this point, or it doesn't have the submit inside of it. Let's go and debug this a bit more. So after going to back and forth between AI, I was able to figure out what the issue was. So let's go and continue. I was able to add a new property. Let's go ahead and add a new property and the uh, test drive. And it's going to get in. I'm going to go and put a price and three bedrooms, two bath, and some of on uh, square feet and then test description. And then I can go and pick the actual image. It navigates you to the to the dashboard where you can see all the different properties that I personally added for myself. Let's go and go to Postgres just to make sure that the properties have been added successfully to the properties. You can see here that the two properties that I just added, the GDF and then three test drive, and then the description right here. And then if you look at the image URL is pointing to Cloudinary to this new URLs right here. Even though the same image, they're pointing to a different endpoint and we can even go to Cloudinary to verify that those images have been successfully been added to our account. You can see here all the images, even though the same, been added to our account. And we can go back and resume our building. We have the property. We're able to register an account. We're able to log in. We're able to manage. So we can go back to your homepage and you can see all the different properties that are listed on this property management listing app. And then we can go to the ones that we added to the properties and we can go ahead and edit it. But the only thing that I haven't really tested at this point is I want to be able to see if I actually can delete it. Let's go ahead and see if we can delete this. It's going to give us a confirmation and we're going to go ahead and click OK. And the property has been deleted successfully. At this point, everything has been added. So let's go and test out the logout feature and see if that's working as well. You can see here that I can now it gives me the login and register. And now I can go and view the details. Actually, one thing that we also want to, want to tackle next is I want to be able to do some filtering here. I want to be able to just type in, let's say, one, two, three for the location and do a search. And you can see here the search is not working. Let's go and fix that one. That should be the last thing that we need to fix. Let's make the search feature work. I want to be able to search by location, min, or max price. That should be the last piece that we add to this property management app that we have here. So after it made some changes, looks like it made a change to the route and see here that it added the routes that file and let's go and look at the full file with the change to see here that it went and changed 
line 133 and it changed this part right here where it's passing in the argument of page let's type in one two three and hit search and still giving us an internal server error. let's go and tell ai that that's a problem i'm wondering when search All right, so we did a lot of back and forth between AI and uh, just fixing some issues, just issues in general. It looks like it did a, a check here on the following steps. It says building the initial prototype has been checked and then implement a feature to create a new property listing has been checked. Everything has been good. Let's go look at the search again. If you go look for a location here for one, two, three, it doesn't throw an exception anymore, which is a good thing. It's a step in the right direction. But let's go and synchronize all our changes to to Git first before we move on and actually fix the search for the property listings app. Everything has been good. Let's go and uh, click on the good and that will send the feedback to them. And then so far, if we go and refresh this, the new change should be here. Four minutes ago, the change has been committed and then we're all back here. Let's go and make a change to the property listing. Make search for property things work. It filters the property based on location, min price, and max price let's go ahead and test it out again looks like it finished one two three let's go and hit search and price so it actually does ain't anything with this it looks like it's actually filtering based on the, the price let's go and put in the price of this one and we want to filter based on the max actually let's go and look a lower price and make sure that it doesn't go above 222,000. It's 998, the max price. Looks like the max price is still not working, but the min price looks like it does. So the location and the min price filter is not working as expected. All right, so it looks like it made some changes. So let's go and Type in one, two, three. I should only see this one right here since this is the only one that has one, two, three. And it looks like it added this new blue section here where it says the actual criteria where it's location. And then for min price is any and then max price is any. But it looks like it's still not working. Can you please perform a search for property with location main in the minimum? Well, let's go and actually following the direction here and let's look for the minimum price of 200,000 and see how many results do we get let's see we're getting six results all right it looks like now the property search is working if i type in one two three or four five six let's go ahead and try four five six i should only get one so one two three should only get one as well which is one two three let's go and clear this one right here all right so one two three four five six and then seven eight nine see if we can get seven eight nine and yeah i'm getting seven eight nine oh i'm getting seven eight nine here because i have a seven eight nine within as part of the address here six seven eight eight nine that would be the zip code i guess so it looks like that's currently working let's go ahead and take a look at the pricing here we make sure we're only getting a minimum price of this see if that works so looks like that's looks about the max, maximum price let's go pick a lower number here looks like this one seems pretty low the maximum price should be this and it looks like yeah so it looks like it's currently working let's go and push and synchronize these changes to github let's go back here the other thing that I noticed here, if you go back, are the pricing. Let's go and yes, it's working. It's working now. Mm -hmm. 
the other change that I want is to change the price to contain to have the correct placing of comma I mean there's a lot of things that we could have done here there's a lot of things that I see here visually that we can also change such as the navigation bar on the top where I want to highlight the properties for instance I also want to include like a map feature but it seems like Replit Agent is strugg struggling with not the map itself but implementing the location where it will pinpoint the location within the map but since our address here are fictitious anyway so there's really no point of implementing map at this point we're gonna go and skip that and like i said it's really struggling with and figuring out the uh the location for the map so we're gonna go and skip that for now i asked it to add a comma for the pricing it looks like it added the comma now to the pricing you can see here that it's nicely formatted last thing that i want to change here before we wrap this up is if you go to view details so everything looks pretty good like i said there's a bunch of things that we can implement here such as multiple images per property you can add that as well that would be a nice feature to add but we're not going to be doing that in this video last thing that i want to add here i want to be able to change the, the navigation where if i'm on a certain uh, page i want the navigation link to be active let's go ahead and hit good for the last change that we want here which is please change the navigation link to be active if you're on that page i don't know if that's gonna take that but uh, let's see how it does with that instruction i want the navigation uh, link for that url to be active let's say if i'm in a properties page i want the properties navigation uh, link uh, to be active i'm gonna go and see if we can interpret that and uh, what's gonna do for that that's my request is to implement the active navigation link highlighting it, it, which is exactly what i requested let's see how it does i've completed the plan successfully the following steps were executed implemented active navigation link highlighting Let's go ahead and click on, looks like it's still not doing it. Let's go ahead and log in. <laughs> Can't type anymore, it's getting late. All right, let's go to properties, dashboard. Um, the navigation active link still not being high added please change we can change please change it the active let's be more explicit here please change the active link to be underlined and have a background of blue and see how it does there look at that the login register it's being highlighted as we navigate to that page which is what what i was expecting let's go and log in again lastly see if that works and let's go and check the add new property that looks like that's being added as well dashboard works as expected we probably don't need the dashboard since the home acts as a dashboard anyways but i'm assuming okay so the dashboard that's just going to be for our property uh and then so we probably don't need to add new property here on the top but in any case everything works as expected add new property you can choose a file here which gets uploaded to cloudinary and this gets added to your dashboard which only shows the properties that you actually added so you can edit and you can delete so yeah, everything works as expected here. The numbers for the bedroom, it looks like it's restricting us to only pick the numbers for the bedroom, but not for the bathroom. The, there's a bunch of stuff here that I probably can change if I take my time to actually just work through this. But those are like some simple uh, changes that we can implement at some point in the future. But 
The major stuff that I really want to implement uh, in this video has been added. The placeholder as far as the image has been added as well and we can we can swap out and change the images. Everything works as expected. The last thing that we want to do is let's add, go in sync with remote first and push the changes to GitHub. So we have the latest change in GitHub now. If you refresh it, the change from a minute ago has been added to GitHub now and we can go back here. So we can close Git and we can actually deploy this. The way you can deploy this is there's a button here that will tell you that it's ready to deploy. So if you don't find this button right here, for some reason, this is like not here. You can go and close this, create a new tab and just search for deployments. So from here, you can switch to a uh, reserve VM, auto scale, static or a schedule if you want a time-based job schedule, which doesn't really make sense in our case because this is a web application. In most cases, you probably want to pick either Reserved VM, um, auto scale, or probably the easy client side apps. Uh, for most scenario, you probably want to choose auto scale as you probably want this to scale appropriately based on the activity on the server. Let's go and go with the auto scale, if, which gives us the most uh, cost-effective choice among the choices here. Let's go ahead and set up our deployment. And then you can pick and edit the machine power. You can change the CPUs, the RAM, and you can change the number of machines. So you can change it up to 10. Since we're just doing a demo here, we're just gonna go and pick one. And then there's some optional settings here, some private deployment, the run command for Python has been set up here since this is a Flask application. So it's gonna automatically input this run command to run this uh, main.py. Uh, and then it's gonna be registered under this private domain, which is real, real estate agent manager coding menace, and then dot replit.app, and then all the deployment secrets, such as the environment variables, variables has been configured automatically, such as the Postgres secrets, passwords, the database and ports, as well as the Cloudinator API key secret and the cloud name. And then you can add additional deployment secret if you need to in the future. Let's go and deploy this. Everything has been configured for our environment and it's ready to go at this point. This usually takes about a couple of minutes to deploy. Once the, the deployment has completed, it's going to go and give you the screen right here where it says production, the status, then it's deployed one minute ago, and then it's going to give you this domain where you can later on set up your own custom domain if you want to, to point into this currently a temporary domain provided by Replit. We can go and navigate to the URL so you can see the actual domain and you can share this domain now to everybody for the realtors to actually use their application. Now that we have completed building the app, I hope that you have gained a little bit of insight on how to work with Replit Agent and Replit. And now here's my thought on Replit Agent in general. My experience with Replit Agent has been a hit or miss. And from my experience using the tool, it has been a pretty buggy one. Not just the fact that it wasn't able to respond correctly to some of my prompt. There's a lot of back and forth as you've seen anywhere from the environment issues that was totally unrelated to the code. An app that I built the day before that was fully functional suddenly stopped working the day after, which is unusual. To me, this seems to be unreliable, but let me go through the pros and cons. And from my perspective, when using Replit Agent, pros being able to generate a prototype in such a short period of time is rather pretty impressive. The platform allows anyone without coding experience to build an application, which is uh, pretty impressive as well. Assuming that you provide it with a very detailed instructions and guidance, let me go through the, the downside as well. While working through Replit Agent, off the bat, you're limited as far as the tech stack that will be used to create the application. Currently, they only support Flask, which is a Python web framework, which is great if you're a Python developer, but if you're not, then you're out of luck. They also use vanilla JS for frontend, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but this doesn't really scale really well for larger projects. And most modern SaaS applications now these days, especially in 2024, use frameworks such as React or Next.js. And lastly, you will need lots and lots of patience as there's going to be a lot of back and forth between just be able to build a simple feature and, and fixing bugs. Those are the main key points that you need to keep in mind if you're considering building apps in Replit uh, using Replit Agent. There it is. I hope that this video has been insightful and have provided you with some value. 
And if so, feel free to hit like on this video. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please go and consider doing so as I will be doing more videos like this in the future. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next one.